blog and partner at MineWires. Over to you, Phil. Hello, uh, thank you. And thank you for everyone for joining us for this conversation. Uh, just to back up, I you know love to keep this interactive. So as there are comments and questions, feel free to add them as we move along. If there's something that I might miss, um, we will definitely get them added in, uh, you know, with moderation. Um, so my name is Phil Hill. I'm a consultant and market analyst with MindWires. I write, and most people know me from the Phil on EdTech blog. But what we wanted to cover today is the future of learning management systems. And on this topic has taken on a renewed interest given what's happening with the global pandemic and where we are. Um, before we move on, I do want to point out that the slides are available at SlideShare and you have the link on the screen. And also a lot of our graphics, people ask if they can have a copy of the graphics. And we have a free resources page at mindwires.com free resources. And there you can download a full resolution graphics and even find the link to the most relevant article that refers to that. But so looking forward to the conversation today. So one thing, if we're going to go into the future of the learning management system, you just cannot do it without looking at COVID and what's happening with uh, the pandemic, the mass move to online. So uh, if you'll indulge me, I wanna cover a little bit about online education and COVID to set the context for the learning management system. Before pre-pandemic, we had been tracking uh, the growing rise in online education, whether it's fully online programs or partially online programs. And this chart right here is showing the percentage of US higher education um, online enrollment, students taking at least one online course, fully online course. And it has been rising and at the same time it's been rising, total US college enrollment has been dropping. So you've seen a significant you know, um, increase from 26% students taking at least one college, uh, one online course in 2012 to fall 2018, which is the last uh, official data we have in the US. It had gone well over one in three students were doing this. So there's definitely an increasing usage of technology in the classroom. But the point I wanted to make here is the fact of just how things have changed. So we go from this multi-year trend to the spring. And again, this is also showing in the US um, and it's data working with our partners at Listed Tech. And we looked at the shift um, in March from mostly face-to-face -face classes into um, fully online classes as a reaction to the pandemic. And it started you know, roughly March 9th, that's uh, when Stanford University, well, University of Washington was first, Seattle University, then Stanford all said they were canceling face-to-face -face classes and moving online. It happened to be during spring, spring break during the Northern Hemisphere, which um, helped with the transition. But the point that's relevant here is within a period of about three to four weeks, all of higher education in the U.S. had transitioned from mostly face-to-face -to, -face to almost fully online. And this gets to an important point. A lot of what's happening with the pandemic are not necessarily new trends, but what we're seeing is pre-existing trends that have been radically accelerated by the pandemic. And I think that's an important context for us to understand for the LMS market. Now, I could have used a similar chart of this for other countries, and in a lot of countries that have a national education system, it would have been an even quicker migration over. But we've gone from something that's taking time over a period of years to activities that suddenly change in a month or less. Now, of course, it's not just online. Really what um, colleges and universities are mostly looking at, particularly as we move into the uh, fall for the Northern Hemisphere, but as we get into September and classes moving forward, is it's primarily a choice, a choice of online or vir uh, virtual or hybrid, where hybrid is a mix of face-to-face -face and online. 
In other words, there are very few cases that are fully going back to face-to-face. -to -face. So what's really happened is we've, uh, we're moving into the hybridization of higher education. The question is how much of this is online, how much of this uh, is going to be face-to-face, -face, and what are the mechanisms to do this type of mix? So this is the world we're in, and these are the problems that really set the stage for where the learning management system or the virtual learning environment as it's known in the UK, where it sits and where the uh, future is likely to be for this system. We actually see, um, we actually see multiple phases in this reaction, the spring, the very rapid transition to remote teaching and learning, uh, what's happening June, July, August, we see a lot of schools that are having to re-add the basics about accessibility, equitable access, um, richer course design that's not just synchronous video. And then we're gonna have probably a period of chaos uh, for the fall as a lot of school, a lot of schools move back to hybrid or some form of face-to-face. -face. And then at some point, we're gonna get into the new normal. So, um, so this is, this is a real challenge that the entire education industry or sector is trying to address. So now let's uh, sort of look of where this puts the learning management system. So, um, and let's, let's set some context of where we are. Uh, if you look at the learning management system in higher education, this is a chart showing the percentage of colleges and universities in um, several different global regions in terms of what is the primary LMS. So that was, uh, so the primary LMS, as you can see, first of all, Moodle is the most commonly used LMS across the globe. We're only showing five global regions right here, but it is true uh, across the globe. You also see a strong usage of Blackboard Learn, uh, D2L Brightspace, and Canvas, and then you have some global differences. One thing about this chart to point out is that North America, to a large degree, is the outlier in terms of what the mix of LMS usage is. And in the US, uh, Canvas from Instructure has become the dominant system in terms of the most used system, but also the fastest growing system. Um, you still have some of the same dynamics in other regions, but there's a pretty big difference in North America. And in this case, referring to the US and to Canada. But in, in here you have Canvas as the top spot. You have Blackboard Learn and Moodle about the same. And then you have D2L Brightspace. And then you have some of the, uh, then you have some of the other systems, including Sakai, um, and, and we'll get into those. So this is uh, the global market of who's primarily using which systems. The other thing I'd want to point out is the fact of how much the LMS market has become somewhat common in terms of what are the primary vendors getting used. Um, so this is, uh, the question is, this is by deployment, by institution, uh, not by enrollment on this chart. Um, so the number of schools using a particular system. Uh, part of the reason it's difficult to deal with, uh, with enrollment is each country measures enrollment differently and it varies whether that enrollment data is available. Um, but it's becoming a very global market where across the globe, with some exceptions, we're talking about a lot of the same systems. Now, as you look at it, you primarily get a, um, you've got the big four, which is Canvas, Moodle, D2L Brightspace, and Blackboard Learn. And increasingly, these are the systems that dominate different regions. It's probably somewhat different in South Africa. Um, I mean, in areas of Africa and in South Asia. Um, but the trend is to become more of a common, um, a, a common set of vendors across the globe. Uh, the question asks, are we going to start adding Africa? We do have Africa in our element, in our regions that we report. Yes, we plan to add it. We're trying to get to a point where we have a high enough coverage 
to put out statistics. But yes, the answer to that is yes, we do plan on doing that. Now, this also captures, it's not just which are the big four, it's that there's an increasing uh, predominance of the big four. So this is looking at North American higher education by enrollment using different systems. And part of what we see is that ever since 2013, we've had the same big four systems. In other words, what are the top four systems by usage, by enrollment in North America? Other regions were seeing similar trends, but this one just wanted to be illustrative of how much the market is consolidating on a smaller number of vendors for most usages. Now, this of course doesn't mean that, uh, that everything is going that way. Um, part of what we are also tracking is that there's been a slowdown in the market uh, since in the past just under two years. So just under two years ago, if you look at the number of schools switching from one LMS to another, it had peaked actually just about two years ago, and it's gone down. But recently, we're starting to see an uptick. So the market was somewhat stable, stabilizing on fewer selections and changes, but lately we've been seeing it increase over time. So we can, if there are questions, we'll go into details, but just wanted to set a sort of a context of where we are in the market. Now, one thing that we've pointed out is the fact, particularly when you look at the slowdown, the LMS market is a difficult market for the vendors. And financially, I know there's a lot of complaints about how expensive systems are and how much money schools are spending but it's very difficult to operate profitably in academic LMS markets. And one of the things that we've been pointing out for at least a year is actually two years now, is the fact that the financial health of the providers is going to have an outsized impact on the future of the LMS. So if you want to understand what's going to be available as an LMS in the future and how it's going to change, you have to understand corporate financial health. And we've seen this recently with Canvas, even though it's the market leader, having significant layoffs, um, combined layoffs of up to 20% of their workforce this year, which is obviously going to impact what they can develop and what they're gonna be doing. But likewise, we've had other um, cases as well. Um, certainly Blackboard, which is also owned by private equity, they've had a series of layoffs. They've been changing the company. They've been selling off parts of the company so that they can focus on teaching and learning. Um, and there's just various issues involved. But the key point is corporate financial health is having an outsized impact. I had said originally in 2018 and 19, but clearly that's having an impact even as we move into 2020. Um, and you could even argue that it's been, become a bigger issue because of COVID-19. And that sort of gets to the point, it's not necessarily new trends we're seeing, but acceleration of trends and making them much more intense. Um, so a question is the current context of flexible and rapid solutions being prioritized. Uh, so part of what, and I get a little bit into this later in the presentation, the importance of stability in terms of system stability, it's reliable, it's got solid uptime, that it has intuitive user interface. So stability is definitely getting prioritized. Uh, and you could argue that's obviously correlated to slow and steady solutions. Now, these aren't the only solutions out there, and there are uh, what I'm considering secondary players, those who are outside of the big four. Now, now you have several of these that have been around for a long time, Sakai being one, the open source project out of the U.S., um, it's been losing quite a few schools, but it still has a strong base, particularly in Spain. Um, but Sky is a secondary player to be aware of. Schoology is an LMS that's primarily targeted at the K-12 market, but they have some higher ed um, positions, particularly with uh, small private universities. So they have somewhat of a play, but they are not trying to increase their higher ed uh, market share. They're focusing on K-12. 
it's learning. It's a system out of Scandinavia. They had certainly lost quite a few of their customers, mostly to Canvas, but it definitely, and we're doing more research on them, but that is a system that is more common in Europe. Jinzabar is a system out of the U.S. that tends to, is tied with the Jinzabar student information system, and it actually uh, is used in small schools. You still have some longtime ones out of Europe, and two that are worth mentioning, Clareline and Ilias, um, that are open source systems that have been around for more than 20 years. And you're not getting really significant new customers on them, but they certainly do have some existing players. Um, I do see a comment. We will research. I do not know M. Elimu, so I'll have to, Melimu, I have to look that up. I am not aware of them, so I'll definitely look at them. Thank you. You have some medium term players. These are companies that have not been around for 10 or 20 years, but certainly have been around long enough for several years and worth watching. NEO by Cypher Learning is one where we recently had a demo and an update. They have, uh, in higher education, they have a strong presence in the Philippines, but now they're starting to grow uh, significantly in Latin America and they're explicitly targeting North America for their higher education growth. But that's a company to watch. Strut Learning uh, used to be, um, Sagent's Learning used to be Flat World. It, they, along with Motivus Learning, are competency-based platforms that have recently expanded to try to have a broader view than just pure competency-based programs. And Camillo is a system that is uh, based on a derivative off of Moodle from years ago. But Camillo, as I understand it, that software is used somewhat in Europe and Latin America. And as far as new systems to be aware of, you have Aula, um, which is out of the UK. And uh, we talked about them recently with our market analysis service. But they are, they have a significant win with Coventry University in the UK, which is part of the reason we're paying so much attention. That you have a, you actually have a system that's taken over, taken over sounds strong, that has been adopted by a 40,000 student university that is, I believe, also the fastest growing in the UK. So ALA is a new system to watch. You also have Google Classroom. Um, which is primarily in the K-12 market uh, in the uh, worldwide. And they haven't chosen to go into higher education, but some people use it, you know, because it's free to adopt. And a lot of people are looking at uh, Microsoft Teams as well as could this be an LMS? Um, and then final one I mentioned was Noteball, which is sort of changing whether it's an LMS replacement or not an LMS replacement. But the point is you definitely have a bunch of secondary players, but more and more it's, uh, we haven't seen any of these have a huge impact outside of Google Classroom in the K-12 market, but they're definitely worth uh, watching. Question have about do LMSs outside of North America tend to support IMS integration standards? Yes, more and more IMS integration standards are being followed even outside of the US particularly in Europe. We're seeing a, a growing adoption there um, and in other areas as well. So yes, not as much as you're seeing in North America, but definitely you are seeing IMS-based integrations. So um, let me, hold on, I have to move my uh, things around. Okay, uh, does Google Classroom, I, I need to, that one I might have to defer about Google Classroom. It's not fully an open system. There is partial LTI standards, but it is not designed to be an open uh, system in the same way that Canvas, Moodle, Blackboard, Detail, the other systems are. So it, it does it, but in a slightly different way. So that gets actually, let's just mention that, that one of the, main things to understand with the LMS market is that when they were originally designed in the late 1990s, the LMSs were the virtual home for online or hybrid courses, but there weren't a lot of free tools available to be used. Today, that's completely changed. 
now you have a whole new world based on all of the tools that are available that could be used in a teaching and learning context. Blogs, wikis, uh, discussion, file sharing, uh, social media. There's just a whole different world. So it's very important to understand that this trend of open integrations to and using the LMS as a hub to sort of bring all of these experiences together is a key part of the future of the LMS. It's already been important, but I see that it will continue to be important. Um, so and this gets to the idea of the um, walled garden, that the, uh, that the LMS was originally designed as a walled garden, that we would have the basics, the grade book, the syllabus, uh, assignments, discussion forums, announcements, all within this walled garden. You had to do it within the LMS. Um, now, over time, you started seeing things such as blogs and social networks outside of the LMS back in the early, two, early to mid 2000s. And the initial reaction of the LMS market was to say, oh, you want to use a blog within your course? The initial reaction is, hey, we'll give you a crappy version of the blog that's inside of the LMS. Oh, you want a social network like Facebook? We'll give you a crappy version within the LMS. This was not really what people wanted, but it was the original reaction of the market. And part of that change in demand is what's led to IMS standards growing in importance, where instead of this approach, it, it, we needed to change. Part of the reason we needed to change is the fact that as more and more tools became available and as more and more features get added to the LMS, quite often many of them very poor imitations of other free commercial tools or other commercial tools, the LMS itself became bloated. It became way, way too many options way too difficult to use and to navigate. And there was a lot of frustration in the market um, because, the mar because the LMS just was becoming a bloated mess, quite honestly. And, in the, late, and uh, the dynamics weren't there. What's happening and what has been happening is now largely due to LTI standards is that you have much more interoperability where ideally in the direction the LMS is mostly going is to say, well, we're still going to be a garden, a safe home for your course and for your academic work, but we're going to provide these pathways to go get the actual third party tools you want to use, but try to do it in a cohesive experience that's tied together by the LMS. So instead of a walled garden, much more of an open ecosystem, but ideally not a chaotic ecosystem, one that actually ties things together. Um, so that's where we, uh, where I think it's a key part of understanding where the market is and where it's going. Um, let's see, a question coming in about Microsoft, do they tend to be competitive in the LMS market? This is probably a question that's relevant for Google as well, outside of the K-12 market. In higher education, big tech has not shown signs that they want to tackle all of the difficult problems that the LMS tries to solve. So in particular, a very complex grade book, uh, very complex add drops and roster integration of how you bring in students and let them add drop and cancel. And do, there's so much of the stuff uh, that is difficult to do and very, uh, very challenging for the LMS providers and big techs such as Microsoft, such as Google have largely said, we're happy only solving part of the problem. And we're not trying to replace the LMS. We're just going to add more and more functionality. So what we've seen largely is the LMS trying to come in and saying, Hey, we will integrate Microsoft teams. We will integrate a lot of the Google suite of applications so that you don't have to have Google classroom. As you, as you use this. So quick answer is I see Microsoft wanting to do more and more of the job, but I have not seen that they intend to be what you're calling competitive and trying to replace what the LMS is. Now, 
uh, let's go back a little bit to where we are with the COVID crisis. This um, survey just came out in the Chronicle of Higher Education, and it looked at how, um, how faculty members viewed the reaction to COVID, faculty members and administrators. They basically said that there's a lot of problems where the courses that from the rapid shift online were worse, moderately worse or much worse. There are some of these, um, that some people said, hey, it actually even made an improvement. But by and large, faculty and administrators are saying the experience that we're providing today with the transition is not as good as many of the face-to-face -face courses that they've replaced. However, there's a strong um, positive, a relatively strong positive outlook where, for example, about two thirds of professors saying that they're mostly positive or somewhat positive about the experience and that they are comp nearly three quarters are confident about teaching entirely or mostly online this fall. So in other words, we're getting indications that faculty are saying, I can use technology in the classroom and I have much greater confidence on doing it. Maybe this spring wasn't perfect, but I feel pretty confident that I know how to do this quite well moving into the fall. Now, there are mixed emotions about whether they're looking forward to online versus face-to-face, -face, but there's much greater actual adoption from faculty um, be on the usage of technology, and which strongly includes the LMS. And we think that part of what this is going to do is it's leading to a greater adoption of the LMS or a deeper adoption. It's used quite a bit more moving forward. Um, so this is a survey that asked students what they thought about what's going on. Top Hat put out the survey. We actually helped analyze the data from an independent perspective, but it's an interesting mix. Students, when you ask college students about the abrupt switch to online, for the most part, they say it's, it's not going well. 68% saying that the instruction they're getting is worse than in person. But at the same time, the majority are rating that their, the school's response and their professor's response is good. It's sending the message that students understand we're in a, uh, that the spring, Northern Hemisphere spring, was an emergency mode. And they're not judging the quality too harshly right now but the fall is going to be very different. So there's a lot of tolerance from students for the spring, other than some uh, challenges about tuition. But this is likely to change once we move into, um, into the future. Students are going to want to have more. And of course, what we're talking about is Zoom U. The predominant, it's not the only usage, but far too much of what happened in higher education and in K-12 is that what used to be face-to-face -face courses got transitioned to synchronous video courses. Um, uh, so uh, I'll get to the question about LMS is not, um, is like a face-to-face class. That's not quite what I'm saying. LMS is used in face-to-face and -face hybrid and and online, it ties together the learning activities, but it does the management. It provides grades, assignments, feedback. It should be a system that holds it together, whether it's face-to-face -face or online or hybrid. But the more online it is, the greater usage there is of an LMS. That's part of what we're saying. But the, the Zoom, there's a lot of pushback on Zoom. And it's not just Zoom. That's not the only problem. This is a this is a problem that we had before, and I'm hoping that I don't have anybody from George Washington University on here, but there was a lawsuit a few years ago about a graduate program where they had gone online, and they, not ju they literally took slides, the printout slides, digitized them poorly, and threw them onto their system and called that an online course. 
this is an actual document coming from the lawsuit where students were saying, this is not education, this is poor quality. And so you see bullet points that aren't, uh, have no context moving forward. So the point is, yes, we're overusing Zoom right now and relying on synchronous video. We have to change and make it a much more of a balance of synchronous and asynchronous education and different tools. And the LMS is key to enable this to happen. But it's not like COVID and Zoom started the problem. We have quite a bit of uh, uh, quite a bit of um, challenges even before there. <laughs> and I do see that I have somebody from George Washington University. I think this led to a review um, of how online education was delivered. This was so bad, and so hopefully it's leading to positive change. So where we are, um, I don't have. It reminds me of the situation of the underpants gnome, where people think that they can just throw something online and then see what happens. I'm not 100% sure if you guys can hear the audio, but this is the, my favorite description of this mentality from South Park. Okay, sounds like the audio's not working. So go look up the underpants gnomes. It's one of my favorite episodes. But in any case, uh, this is from uh, Stephanie Moore, University of Virginia, where she was reviewing a tweet that, um, uh, no, the, it was not Pearson and Embinet where the course was from. But on this case, uh, Stephanie Moore, who I co-authored a post in this topic, was pointing out that certainly the emergency usage that we've had recently, she, she uh, related it to when you dash to escape a wildfire, you don't try to compare your temporary living conditions to your previous house. So be careful about trying to say, is online good or bad? And in fact, what she, the post that she and I wrote, it's called Planning for Resilience, Not Resistance, uh, was really trying to say that we we know that the medium of online or hybrid or face-to-face, -face, there's no inherent one being better than the other. The medium itself is not the difference. The difference is in the design, how well a course has been designed, how effectively it's taught, what kind of support that happens with the with the course, that it's the design process and effectiveness of these methods that are most important moving forward. And again, that question gets into where the LMS plays. It, the future of the LMS should be supporting this improved design moving forward, but the timeline has been radically changed due to COVID. Um, and so the importance of supporting effective instructional design has just been jumped way up in the priority list. A uh, quick question about high flex. I mentioned that in the hybrid slide. High flex is where students get to choose between online versus face-to-face -face activity. So it's flexible from a student choice. And absolutely an LMS is a key part of enabling that to happen. A lot of schools are moving that direction because of the unknown. So yes, high flex is a key move a lot of schools are using to handle the current transition and the LMS uh, plays a very important role in this. So we're, since we're talking about these changes, if I had to summarize where the LMS needs to improve the most, or to at least enable the improvement the most of all areas, it's in engagement. And yes, this is where we have uh, the Brady Bunch. Um, it's, it's engaging interactions between faculty and students, between students and students, that's consistently been a problem that needs to be improved upon. Going back to the top half uh, survey of students, um, you know, they show it, it, engagement just came out more and more of what students are saying, this is what's missing 
from what we did this uh, what we did this spring. The class experience is not engaging. They miss faculty face to face and faculty and student engagement. So engagement is the area that's got the biggest deficit right now on how we're delivering education. But just like many of the other things we're talking about, that's not new. This is a um, survey from 2014 that Educause did. Um, they did an ECAR report on the LMS, and they looked at, in this case, faculty satisfaction with LMS features. And more and more, the LMS does the basics. It allows you to post content, handle assignments, um, receiving them, managing them, entering student progress information. But the area that, as you start going down, that's one of the worst areas of satisfaction has been engaging in meaningful interactions with students. So this is to point out, we don't have a new problem here, but we have a problem that with COVID, it's now become even more important and even more central to what students are wanting to have that can be done differently. Um, let's see. So a uh, quick question about the, does the current situation, do we need a redesign or remold? Oh, what we've seen over time is the LMS market is quite resilient um, and it's not static. It, the LMS adapts, and what's been happening so far is the same LMS. The design has been modified over time to become more responsive. So one example is stability. If you used to have an LMS, you would have a, quite often if it was self-hosting or even if it was managed hosting, the LMS would go down during finals week or the first week of class, very frustrating. But over time, so much of the LMS market has migrated to the cloud and become much more stable in and of itself. You definitely had some problems in March and April, but by and large, the LMS market has adapted to what student and faculty demands have been in the world of stability. And so what we've, that's just one example, but you tend to see the LMS adapting over time and as opposed to we need a whole redesign. One other way to look at it is competency-based learning and mastery learning. There's a reason why the motivists of the world and the strut learnings of the world have not taken, gone too far. It, that is a niche market for competency-based programs. And what we've seen in reality is more traditional schools doing competency light programs. They're not full competency-based. And by and large, not exclusively, but more and more using the traditional LMS, but requiring the traditional LMS to add self-paced and mastery-based learning features so that it could handle this new educational demand. So going back to your question, what about today's situation and in particular about engagement? Will that happen from just a redesign or will the LMS change over time? That one's tricky because quite honestly, this problem's been around for a while and we haven't seen too much meaningful change. I think we've seen more meaningful change simply from integration and allowing meaningful engage <coughs> engagement in other apps that the LMS adds together. So my initial sense is that the engagement is increasing the priority on re uh, useful integration with third party tools so far. Um, let me uh, do, do, grab onto this because there's another key thing is data. Let me skip that actually. We'll come back to data in just a second. But there's a part of this I want to make sure we have covered. And that is another, um, it's looking at data around who has access to education and how well is it supported. So equitable access to education. This is crucial. I'm looking at my home state. This is for the California Community College System. And this is data that they have looking in this first case, what are the course outcomes of face-to-face -face versus online? And what you clearly see is, you know, 10, 15 years ago, there was a much larger gap 
between how effective online was in terms of students passing the courses and moving on versus face to face. But over time, at least within the California community college system, that gap keeps shrinking. And the main way that it keeps shrinking is yes, face to face is getting or becoming more effective marginally from a student a success rate, but online courses are improving more and more. And a lot of this is based on the increased investment in California on course design. The CVC OEI initiative is really pushed and we're part of that. We've been consulting with them for years, using a rubric for course design and encouraging peer review, providing free tools. So there's been greater support for well-designed courses and greater investment in student support initiatives. So advising and support even outside of the classroom. So there's, there are many factors involved, but the point is this is where so much of the emphasis is today is increasing the outcomes of students, uh, addressing the gap that has been there historically between online course outcomes and face-to-face. -face. But also we need to get into um, equitable access by demographics. Obviously the U.S. has got a, uh, is going through a lot of turmoil right now um, from a racial perspective. A lot of it's based on uh, policing activities, but it goes beyond that. This is also data from the California Community College system looking at success rates by ethnicity for online only. And in this case, we're tracking different um, ethnicities. And this one's sort of mixed, as you can see over time. The good news is student outcomes are improving in all cases for all ethnicities that are being measured, and that's good. What's not happening yet is reducing the gap and, and effectively dealing with uh, ethnic uh, issues in terms of how well they have access to the courses, how well they're supported in the success rates. This gap, I, I'm not arguing that we can make all gaps come to zero and that everybody's treated the same, but I am saying that it's critically important that colleges and universities look at all kinds of demographic groups and ask themselves questions, how well are we supporting different groups? Come back to the LMS, LMS certainly is not a panacea, but that's where you have the ability to expand the use of uh, accessibility from a disability perspective, and eight, um, you know, for sight impaired or hearing impaired students to provide additional support, diff uh, different resources, to make sure all different groups are being supported, to be able to actually collect data and help with researchers, such as what we're seeing here, to check to see how well we're doing. But this overall context, there's no easy answer, but it's a huge part of the future is how do you effectively address these types of problems. And let, let me just check. The comment about MOOC platforms um, MOOCs are out there, they're realistic, but so far I'd say the biggest impact MOOCs have had on the LMS market is they increase the priority that you have an easy to use intuitive system and one that's highly scalable, can handle a large number of students. And thirdly, it opens up the idea of not just having a fixed roster of students, having the capability for classes to allow multi-campus collaboration or guest uh, students or faculty and open up the system from that perspective. So MOOCs don't directly impact the LMS market, but they have impacted it in, in that way. Um, the question was there about the disaggregated tools uh, such as Duke University's kits. Um, the kits is a really interesting idea. It's worth following. Um, where they're pulling together a patchwork of systems uh, to provide the LMS capabilities. It's not new. 
uh, from the standpoint of SUNY back in the uh, in the mid two thousands was working on an, a learning management operating system that had a lot of the same ideas. So the, there are disaggregated tools. There have been a lot of initiatives that go back at least one to two decades. And those, the bigger impact there has been more on the lessons learned and showing where we shouldn't restrict ourselves to only having one type of system, which therefore increases the importance of integration standards and capabilities. However, I do not see disaggregated tool initiatives as being a growing trend. I sort of see the opposite, as a matter of fact that the importance of having one virtual learning environment is becoming more and more important as with the rapid increase in usage. So those initiatives are important, but I wouldn't classify it as a trend that's having a huge uh, impact beyond the individual schools yet. And a uh, point here gets into adoption. So much of what we're talking about is the level of adoption and how that changes the dynamics. Um, so this comes from the uh, from Everett Rogers, where he did a lot of the technology adoption curve. But the key insight here is the fact that you have different types of people and how they adopt. Innovators and early adopters are very different than the majority of people. They're willing to take a risk. They're willing to patch things together. But if you're trying to get beyond typically 20 to 25% of the population, then you want, that's where customers typically want complete solutions, convenience. If I'm gonna have to use this system, just make it work. I don't want it to go down. I don't wanna have to go patch this together myself. If you're forcing me to use it, just make it work. Now, quite honestly, that's where Zoom has done so well. It just works and it's just there. And for faculty, they tend to say, oh, this is quite similar to my face-to-face -face lecturing. So the, this technology adoption is important, particularly that there's a chasm. There's a big difference between the left side and the right side here. That puts a real stress on support staff because support staff, particularly today, they don't get to choose to only support the ed tech enthusiast or the majority. They've, they have to, what I'm calling, straddle the chasm. They have to support the people who want to push the boundaries, try things out, not be constrained by existing systems. But at the same time, they have a growing number, particularly of faculty, who say, hey, if I'm doing stuff, it just needs to be work. It just needs to work. It just needs to be safe. And so this puts a real stress on institutions and support staff that are trying to support both sides of this curve, if you will. One of the net effects of where we are today is, and I've mentioned this several times, but we're further increasing the importance of an intuitive LMS design, often at the expense of a complete set of features, but something that's pleasing to use, a little training is required, it tends to be scalable hosting, which tends, which is mostly public cloud hosting, so that it's there. It can, in the spring, we quadrupled the usage of the main LMS systems, at least, on how much their features were being used, and they had to scale within a matter of weeks. That was, it was able to do this largely because of the cloud hosting model that's changed over time. But this leads to challenges. How do you balance this simple intuitive design with the rich and configurable design that could increase student engagement and increase competency and mastery learning? So one of the challenges, it's really important to be simple and intuitive, but how do you give richer features? This is where the LMSs vary quite a bit in their approach. They're not commodities where you can just swap from one to the other and it works exactly the same. They have very different approaches. But there's also a challenge of how do they stay in business? There's huge financial pressure on these companies and it's a challenge of how, um, how they do it. And in particular, we get back to engagement. We've got to 
do much better than just the threaded discussion board, which is historically how the LMS has handled discussions and engagement. The whole industry tied together by the LMS has to improve how students feel like they're engaged and communicating in an online format. And so we have some real challenges uh, that we need to address. And let me just bring up a final point and then we'll go to more of the questions. What I believe when uh, we look at the general ed tech area, but that directly impacts LMS, is I think that we're in the midst of an inflection point in higher ed. And we're dealing with mainstream adoptions, different platform designs, and we're moving beyond the digitization of the traditional classroom. And that's where the, the bad George Washington example or the Zoom University example, we're moving past that and need to get into how can we use tools to design things even better than we can do purely face-to-face? -face? So this whole set of issues leads to an inflection point th that we're at. And unfortunately, COVID-19 is actually increasing these trends. So I really believe we're at an inflection point and what you're going to be seeing moving forward are driven by these issues and how, and how can we do better in education and engagement with students. And currently, and I haven't seen any trends changing this yet, the LMS is best positions to tie these pieces together to be a true virtual learning environment um, moving, uh, moving forward. So the future of the LMS gets into how well can each of the vendors solve these problems, not necessarily by themselves, but also by enabling multiple ed tech solutions that can be tied together, but all had held together by much more effective instructional design and teaching practices. So it's a complex world, but that's a quick view of where I think we are. And uh, let me just check, um, go through some more of the questions. Um, the, 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 the Blackboard, um, uh, WordPress campus. Uh, I'm just sort of seeing which one I should jump in. Since engagement is a critical component and this is re relying on instructor facilitation skills, do I see a growth in faculty development offering? Um, <laughs> this is a challenging question, Vivian. I see the need for, for, for growth in faculty development offerings. Um, but I, that doesn't equate into schools actually investing in this. What we've seen in the spring is just a proliferation of free resources to help people understand what they can do to be better instructors, better course designers, and I realize those go together. So the number of resources available, that absolutely has grown but it's actually a problem. There are just hundreds of places to go for free resources and it makes it unusable in many cases. What's missing is somebody to act as a curating group to say within this local context, a community college, uh, in this region of the world, this type of university, whatever the local context is, somebody to say, here are the resources that make the most sense for us and we're going to make it easy to find and easy to use. That's the gap is having schools and countries invest in this knowledgeable curation. So we have seen a growth in content, but that's not the same as seeing the growth in invest in services that are actually needed in my opinion. Um, Question up, uh, if LMS brands are mostly the same sort of thing, why do so many schools change? That gets to my last point. I don't think that the LMS is a commodity. I think that the LMS, if you look at a checklist of features, they look the same. I think that they look like, all right, do you have a discussion board? Do you have a grade book? Can you do this? Can you integrate with the student information system? You know, you can do hundreds of features. If you do a checklist of features, the LMS brands look to be the same sort of thing. But if you look more at a strategic sense, 
<coughs> at, well, what is your philosophy on bringing in third party tools? How easy do you make that process? So do you encourage the usage of many tools all tied together or do you actually encourage just use our tools at the same time? If you, how do you approach this challenge of use, you know, provide a lot of features, but make sure that the user experience is very simple and intuitive up front and you only see the advanced features as you need them. Those have tremendously different approaches between the brands. So going to your question, why do so many schools change from one to the other? It's that the LMS is not the same sort of thing. They have very different user experiences and different approaches to solve some of these problems. Um, and da, 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 what are your thoughts? Um, oh, there's a question. What are my thoughts on faculty? Oh, this is the one we're saying it's not really part of the question. Um, have you seen lower resistance? Oh, this is a really good question from uh, Miss Anonymous. Um, have you seen a lowering resistance towards online from leadership and executives and academic institutions? Um, absolutely. And after COVID-19, it's not just resistance, it's also a matter of awareness. Everybody is, not everybody, the vast majority of educators are touching upon online tools and how they get used in the classroom. You can't avoid the subject. So what's gone away is the ability to say, uh, that just affects the continuing ed department. That just affects a handful of teachers, but it'll never impact what we really do as a university. I think that that resistance has been lowered tremendously. <clears throat> and that's not even new. I think that MOOCs did a great job, not for what they claim to do, but in lowering resistance, getting elite universities to, to understand that online and hybrid education can have a very important strategic role and can be as good or better than face-to-face -face if designed pro properly. So yes, I do see lowering resistance and we haven't seen the full impact of that, Jeanette Wiseman, my colleague, argues that this might be the biggest change in the LMS market, is getting a new group of people who previously were somewhat resistant towards online and online tools, who are now involved in it, particularly faculty, students, but even administrators, and that that could change um, the LMS market moving forward. As you'll have a much broader group of people with key needs um, moving forward. But given this, I do need to do a time check. Uh, should we take any more questions or how, um, how would you like to handle that? Sure, Phil. How about you pick one more question and then we will wrap up the session. Oh, that's, uh, I'm going to cheat. From Michelle, thanks so much for this great webinar. My response is great question and comment. So thank you very much. Um, let's see. Did, uh, one of the, that was a joke. One of the biggest critiques I hear about the LMS is the lack of creativity, feels like just like filling in the boxes. That gets to the instructional design question. The LMS poorly used can look bad and it will become the face of resistance if it's not used properly. But there are plenty of examples where that's properly designed and properly taught in real, real creativity where the LMS enables that. So it, LMS can be good, LMS can be bad. It's really about in the hands of who's using it, the faculty and the support staff and the, the designer. So, and it does have an impact of how well, how easy do you make it for these people to effectively use the tools? That's the key question moving forward. All right, great. Thanks, Phil. And uh, thank you everyone for, for joining us today. And thank you, Phil, for your insights and expertise on the learning management systems. I know I learned a lot from this session and I hope uh, everybody else did as well. Uh, I will be posting the recording to this session on www.teachonline.ca. Uh, there is a tab that is called webinar series. Uh, click on that and then all of our webinars are listed there. Um, this one will be uh, located in the 
past section because uh, it is now complete and it will be an on-demand recording. Um, you can also check out our website there for all of our other upcoming webinars. So thank you again, Phil. This was a great session and thank you everyone for joining us. Well, thanks, Sarah. And thank you, everyone.